I'd like to call to the stage Dave Reeves, Managing Director of Calidus Resources Limited. Dave Reeves, Calidus Resources Managing Director, is a qualified mining engineer with over 30 years mining experience in Australia, Africa and Europe, and has been instrumental in the progression of four mining projects through feasibility to project development. He holds a first class WA Mine Manager's ticket and a graduate diploma in finance and investment and has extensive experience in international capital markets through his involvement with various listed London and Australian companies. Dave was the managing director of Karas Resources when Karas consolidated the Calidus project area and is currently a director of Karas Resources and non-executive chairman of European Metal Holdings. Please welcome Dave. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Calidus Resources is a exploration and development company up in the Pilbara of Western Australia, uh, just outside of Marble Bar. Now, for any uh, interstate or international visitors, Marble Bar features quite prominently uh, on most news uh, in the evening during summer, uh, generally topping the state for the, the temperature. And Calidus actually means hot or warm. Uh, in Latin, which we think is quite appropriate. I also would like to thank diggers here for this red sort of Dante circle of hell surrounding the presentation. This is what it's like in Marble Bar on a hot summer's day, and it does warm the cockles of my heart figuratively and literally to, uh, to see that. So where are we? As we said, Marble Bar. So we are in the Pilbara. The Pilbara is the heart of Australian mining with iron ore, obviously, but it also is very well endowed with gold. Uh, nearest operating mine is Millennium Minerals, about 100 kilometres away. Uh, we've got the birthplace of Northern Star at Paulson's and our Ashburton project further down the road, and obviously Capricorn Minerals, De Grey and others. Um, but with that expansion of the iron ore, uh, the Pilbara is actually a really good place to build a mine. There is a lot of infrastructure uh, in place already. Uh, we fly into Port Hedland, it's a two-hour drive on a sealed road out to Marble Bar. Uh, it's 20 kilometres on a all-weather council-maintained road uh, out to the mine site itself. There's a bitumen airstrip in town, 100 rooms, and a really good pub that serves a really cold beer on a hot summer's day. If we zoom in uh, and have a little look at the geology of the tenement area, so we control what's called the Warrawoona Greenstone Belt. So basically we've got two big granites, and between that, sandwiched between them is a, a mafic and ultramafic greenstone belt and it's that sandwiching with all the fluids that's created the, the deposits uh, that we've been exploring. The, the centre of mass for us uh, is Klondike. Uh, this was a, an area that was mined previously. Gold was actually discovered in the Marble Bar region in 1891, so two years before Kalgoorlie. Uh, a railway was put in, a first railway in the Pilbara from Port Hedland to Marble Bar just after 1900. And then I think people chasing the, the cooler climbs of Kalgoorlie have basically left the gold field idle. Uh, and through consolidation, seven transactions, uh, we've pulled together uh, the package that you see before you. Um, so when people here talk about 500 metres or 1,000 metres, or in the case of Cal, I think it's down to about 1,300 metres now, uh, there's been no modern mining up in this area, and we see that as a, a real advantage uh, moving forward. We listed only two years ago with 400,000 ounces. Uh, we've tripled that to just over 1.2 million ounces, uh, and that's formed the basis uh, for our pre-fees that we announced a couple of weeks ago. So if we have a look at this uh, with a bit of a fly-through, you can see the ridge lines that are formed from that squashing between the granites. Um, this produces these parallel shears, which hosts the gold mineralisation at Klondike. You can see it's standing out uh, on ridge lines there in the outcropping rock. There is no pre-strip. The gold literally uh, pops out its surface and you can jump up and down and roll around on it if you so desire. Looking in section, uh, you can see it's a, a vertical dipping ore body, some very nice widths and grade. On average in the open pit we're probably talking 20 to 25 metres uh, wide across a mineralisation zone that now stretches uh, over five kilometres in length. Now that mineralised zone uh, we've divided into two areas. We've got the open pit resource uh, which sits above the 100 metres RL, which is about a 180 metres vertical depth. That contains 930,000 ounces of resource with 670,000 ounces in the indicated category. Beneath that and open at depth is the underground uh, with 220,000 ounces of resource at just over three grams a tonne. 
We superimpose the pit in the underground on that resource, and you can see we've really just targeted the, the two kilometre stretch of the indicated resource that's there. To the east and west is mainly inferred, and what we've got is this pit, uh, and beneath that just a conventional sub-level open stope. There's a couple of pits on what we call the St George Shear, just parallel. Uh, we've recently announced some really nice drilling out there, you know, around the 13 metres uh, at 13 grams, etc. And we're seeing some high-grade shoots develop. And we've got a decline cross-cutting another shear that we've recently highlighted with IP. Um, the project itself, very compact, um, conventional CIL plant located just outside the blast zone from that one pit uh, for simplicity of operation. And with this topography, it's a real advantage for us uh, in being able to, uh, if you like, hide the, hide the waste dumps, but also use things like valley field tail stand, which I'll talk about more in the, in the capital side. So what does this equate to in actual metrics? Uh, it's a 100,000 ounce producer over six years is the first peg in the sand for the pre-fees. Uh, very conventional open pit underground, as I said, and we'll talk more about the Met side next slide. But what I do want to talk a bit about is uh, the conservative nature and the accuracy uh, of this estimate. Uh, there's obviously been a, a few speed wobbles in the gold sector, junior gold sector and development sector of late. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into uh, investigating our dilution factors and modifying factors because if you look at all of those projects, the one thing that's, uh, if you like, been the, the problem moving forward has been grade. So we've been very conservative on grade. There's a very high dilution and all loss factor. And we've also put a lot of effort into the accuracy of this study. It's minus 15 plus 20 percent compared to the normal plus minus 25 percent accuracy. What does that equate to? Economics, uh, 150 million, 8% uh, pre-tax MPV. Uh, we're talking 234 million at 2,000 an ounce. And I just, uh, for fun, put in to see what the spot price today was, and that takes it over a 300 million uh, NPV as we speak. What are we doing moving forward? Well, de-risking is a big part of that. We'll be putting a lot of resources into measured. Um, we'll be doing further conversion of inferred uh, to indicated as we move forward for the next year. And beyond that, we've got a lot of blue sky upside that I'll take you through shortly. Uh, just touching on the processing facility. Uh, so as I said, very simple. Uh, we've got a jaw crusher uh, into a sag mill, gravity, CIL, gold bars. As you can see, we've got a coarse grind, we've got soft rock, we've got very good recoveries, both gravity and overall. Uh, and when you look at that, what does that equate to? $15 a tonne processing cost um, with good revenue recovery. So it's about as good as you could hope for from a metallurgical point of view. Uh, if we have a look at the capital and operating costs, um, starting with the operating costs, 11.50 an ounce on average, that's 10.50 an ounce from the open, open pit, 12.50 an ounce um, from the underground. And again, when you consider those modifying factors, the amount of dilution we've put in, you know, we see a lot of upside in those factors as we fine tune them through the feasibility stage. Uh, on the capital costs, we had GRs doing the process plant, and they came up with a, a value of 72 million as an EPC project they'd be happy to build tomorrow. Very happy with that number. The 16 million that you see as the owner's costs uh, might feel a bit light to some, but again, it's being in a, a, a place of good infrastructure that we've uh, piggybacked off. So we've got a, a bitumen airport at Marble Bar. We've also got the old Corona Downs World War, Four, uh, World War II Air Force Base, 10 k's away we can upgrade. Uh, we're looking at a second-hand camp out of, out of Newman. Uh, that Tails Dam and the Valley Fill I talked about, that's only a 250 long embankment, and that's our Tails Dam uh, done for the life of mine. Communications, we've just fired back into Telstra at Marble Bar. So there really are a lot of advantages um, to being and operating just outside Marble Bar. The one thing that will probably change in the fees, we've got almost 30 million of pre-production capital. That's 10 million of surface or open pit mining, 20 million of underground. We'll probably look at pushing that 20 million back, the underground, focus on that open pit, make sure we're hitting our straps before we start the underground. And that underground uh, is mining ore from surface. It's not pre-strip, it's building a stockpile, helping to de-risk the project by making sure we've got a lot of revenue uh, sitting up on the ROM pad. So where do we go from here? How do we add value? So we've talked about the 1,800 and the 2,000 uh, valuations on the NPV. Well, we are doing a lot of brownfields drilling. We've got one rig on site at the moment. The second one's about to, to join that. 
And that's twofold. That's both for de-risking uh, and adding additional mine life. We'd like to take this towards eight years as a mine life uh, before we press a button. That will help us um, Afternoon tea is ready. Afternoon tea is ready. Uh, and we see that as good use of time in the, in the year ahead. Uh, on top of that, we can optimise the study. And more importantly, there's a lot of regional exploration still out there. If we just have a look in long section briefly where that drilling is, uh, there's the pit out to the east. That's all inferred. We haven't included, the, included that resource in the pre-fees because that is all inferred. So we want to put more drilling into the top 50 metres, continue to extend that pit out to the east. It did optimise, um, but with uh, ASX being as they are these days, uh, we thought it wiser to leave that uh, for a later date. Uh, down dip, it's open. Uh, we've had a structural geo out in site recently. He says, what you see in strike, you will see in depth. Um, so this, this deposit is open. Keep in mind there's a million ounces already in there, uh, well, 1.1 million ounces. And so if we kept drilling this down, this is a multi-million ounce deposit over time. So we'll aim to infill some of the inferred, convert that to mine life, and also start to show some of these high-grade shoots as they continue at depth. Further to the west, we recently announced some drilling out to the west. These are life of mine uh, grades from some of the old workings out to the west, another five kilometres. And we drilled holes like eight metres at eight, 12 metres at two and a half, that we just put out there based on some hyperspectral imagery. So, you know, we are very excited about uh, the potential, uh, not just at Klondike and what we know, but further along strike to the west. If we look outside of Klondike, uh, we did 7,000 soil samples over the, the last year. Um, there are multiple targets here. There are multiple styles of mineralisation to chase up. There's granite greenstone contacts, there's porphyries, there's different ages of rocks, there's extensions to Klondike. Uh, we recently picked up the Marble Bar tenement uh, 20 k's away that covers the old Marble Bar gold field itself, uh, which is a different style again. So there's multiple targets and most likely uh, next year is when we'll really start to, to hone in on them and do some more drilling once we've got uh, this mine life extension and uh, confidence drilling complete this year. Talking about that a bit more, what's the timeline look like? We are going to submit to the EPA um, for a review. Uh, that enforces a timeline of us of sort of 12 to 15 months in discussions with the EPA. So we're going to use that time wisely, um, do this de-risking drilling, add mine life and therefore add value to the company, undertake some of that regional drilling, uh, on the back of all of that, uh, do a resource upgrade that will allow us to complete the feasibility. But in parallel with that, we'll be advancing um, some debt conversations, be looking at pointing a debt advisor shortly, so that when those permits come in, we're ready to press a button uh, and begin construction. Uh, briefly on the, oh, we seem to have missed a slide. No, okay, it's not appearing on this one. So on the corporate overview, uh, as we talked about, Keras uh, was the vendor of, that, of this project uh, into a two cent shell, uh, and that's why they are there as the, the largest shareholder. Uh, Alkane Resources recently uh, has been supporting us uh, with cash injections, uh, which has enabled us to complete that pre fees. Alkane is a gold producer in New South Wales, um, and I see this as a, a good investment. They see the disconnect between the developers and the producers. Uh, and they see that by helping us move into production, there's very good value for that cash deployment on their behalf. Uh, there's a big cross through here. That's nothing against Eagle. We're just saying there's another one that bites the dust. Um, if we look at you know, potential developers out there, what are they? Well, Capricorn and Echo at around 100,000. One's at 180 million market cap, one at 150. We're just over 50 million market cap. So we see real value in our, our share price at the moment, especially with the cupboard being quite bare uh, and one by one other projects uh, slowly being acquired by the, the producers who are obviously so cashed up in this, in this gold environment. Uh, time's almost up. Uh, come and meet some of the team. We've got Jane and Paul here. Paul was recently GM at uh, Kerasty Dam with Saracen. Uh, Jane has a wealth of experience as well as our geology manager. And I'd just like to stress that between the team we have built and operated numerous mines uh, in Australia and around the world, and we think that's you know, vitally important uh, as you begin this journey. So in summary, we've tripled the resource in two years, we've completed a pre-fees, we're now undertaking further works to extend that mine life, add further value, 
um, show that there's a lot of blue sky uh, potential moving forward, lots of news flow coming up with that drilling, lots of upside with the regional exploration. If you have any queries, please come and see us at the booth. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave.
of strategic partners are well advanced. Watch this space. With 100% ownership of the, of the project, we've got great flexibility and control of our destiny, and none of our product is committed yet. Ironeer also has a very strong board for a company its size. James Calloway, our chairman, was chaired or Cobre as it progressed from an explorer to being the first new lithium brine operation in 20 years. Alan Davies ran the energy and mineral division of Rio Tinto, which includes the boron mine in California, as well as the Yadar lithium boron deposit in Serbia. Well, finally, with Rylite Ridge having many strong points, such as dual revenue, quality partners, great mining jurisdiction, structurally low costs. It really is set to become the largest lithium, lithium mine in the U.S. and the next major boron mine globally. Thanks for listening. Do we have a question for Roger in the crowd? No questions. Okay, we'll break for afternoon tea. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>